My father had 90 years, but it seemed, 93 years, but it seemed short. In his seemingly long life of 93 years, it was short because it, it just seems like if we only had more time. Old Testament gives us a view of some people who live to be five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred years old. If I have a chance to ask, I will ask, how come we got short changed? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a good question if you had a chance to ask? Imagine seven, eight, nine hundred years to watch generation after generation after generation after generation stay healthy and well. I mean, you gotta have, you gotta be healthy to make it to 900. You gotta take your vitamins. I'm pushing the Bible, I'm pushing vitamins. I mean, I'm doing good today. So, the key is time is precious. Now let me give you Bill Bailey's description of time. Life is not just the passing of time. Life is not just the passing of time. Life is a collection of experiences. Their frequency. And their intensity. Life is not just watching the clock tick away. Life is a collection of experiences. Their intensity, their frequency. When my friend Mark died at age 44, someone says, that's young to die. But what if he lived four lifetimes in one? It might not be too young. So here's what it, whatever the span of your life turns out to be, here's what you want to fill it up with, experiences and the intensity of those experiences. But now let's talk about the management of time. Here's one of the best ones we covered earlier. When should you start building this hotel? Answer as soon as you have it finished. Now jot this one down on time management. When should you start the day? As soon as you have it finished. Plan the day the best you can leaving plenty of room for improvising and surprises and all the stuff that happens during the course of the day. But if you've planned a good productive day, now you start that day, you can't believe how much more valuable your time will be. Don't start the day until you have it finished. Now here's the next one. Don't start the week until you've had it finished. Now to lay out a week is a pretty good challenge. Next, don't start the month until you have it finished. The places to go and the people to see and the productivity and the sales and the customers and the development and all the rest of what you want to accomplish during the course of 30 days. Don't start the month till it's finished. And then here's the big one. This is really challenging. Don't start the year until you have it finished. To the best of your ability. It can't be finished like minute by minute. But in terms of the sweep of what you want to accomplish, in the year 2002. Make sure that that's set and ready to go by the time January 1st rolls around. And it might get all upset. It might get torn up and you do a new one. You make so much progress the first 90 days that now you've got, you've multiplied it all by two by three. Because that happened to me. I thought, wow, here's how, this is gonna be a great year. By the time I'd finished the third month, I'm rolling, I'm soaring. So many things are happening. I revised my whole year's plan. Okay. Now, jot this down. Approaches to the management of time. Here's the first one. Ignore the subject. I mean, that's good advice. Don't let anything overly bug you. Because remember now, you don't have to do anything. Someone says, well, I've got to get a handle on my time. And the answer is, no, you don't. If you want to let it all go, you can let it all go. I mean, this is good advice. Somebody says, you ought, you ought, you ought. Jot this down. Ignore all the you oughts or you should. Only if they're giving general information. We should. It's better to say if you're teaching, we should. Not you should. We should. 
then you let me listen in without it being too confrontational. If everyone did this, see, that'd be great. And then you give a person a chance to choose to do it or not to do it. But when you start the you ought, you ought, now see if I don't, now see we've got some tension and maybe some problems. So you ought seem to always create problems. When you're talking to your kids, you say, no, if kids would do this, not always saying if you did this, if you did this, life would be better, but if kids did this, life would be better. It's like making a little talk and letting them listen in. And then it's a little less confrontational. It gives us a choice. In one of my seminars, here's what I teach. All life form strives to the max of its potential except human beings. All life form strives to the max of its potential except human beings. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it possibly can. You never heard of a tree growing half as high as it could. No, trees don't grow half. A tree drives its roots as deep as it can, reaches as high as it can, produces every leaf it can, every fruit it possibly can. To the max, every life form strives to the max, except human beings. Now, why not human beings? Jot this down. You've been given the dignity of choice. You're not a robot. You don't have to repeat this year the same as last year. You can tear up last year's plan, develop a new plan. So, the dignity of being a human being. Now, here's the choice on being a human being. To be part of all we were meant to be, or to be all. To strive for all, or half, or part, or some. The choice is up to you to develop one skill or ten skills. Someone says, well, I'd be happy with just one more language. Well, some say, hey, I'm going to learn six or seven. And this is all a matter of choice. And when someone says, no, you ought to learn four, you've got to resist all that. Because this is personal dignity. And you don't want to destroy someone's dignity by, by doing all the oughts and they feel reluctant to do it. Now we've got problems. So if you want to, just ignore this subject on time management. Now here's the next one. Step down to something easier. The guy's in sales, and he says, oh, I want to own the company. Finally owns the company. Now he's got no time to play golf. He said, when I was in sales, I was making big money playing golf three days a week. Heck with this owning something. Heck with managing. My life was never my own after I started to manage. I'm going back to sales. See, this is the key. If you're getting too pressed, you might consider stepping down to something with a little easier time pressure. Little girl says to her mother, Daddy comes home, brings his briefcase and pats me on the head and says hello, disappears and works on his papers. How come my daddy doesn't play with me? And her mother said, look, your daddy loves you very much, but he has, he's so busy at work, he can't get it all done, he has to bring it home. He loves you, but that's why he can't play with you. And the little girl said, why don't they just put him in a slower group? <laughs> so... Jot this down now. If you don't have time for your kids, you might consider joining a slower group. Remember when I said some things I went for cost me too much? So reconsider. Next key to time management. And that's work longer and harder. But see, there's a limit to that. I almost lost my health the first year. I went so crazy about personal development and achievement. I just went bonkers. You know, I told you I was skinny, but at the end of that first year, I was a walking shadow. And then it suddenly occurred to me, what if I got rich and too ill to spend it? I mean, that was a shocker. So I started, you know, developing a little more reasonable because I said, if 12 hours won't do it, I'll work 14. If that won't do it, I'll work 18. I mean, how many hours it takes. And sure enough, it, it cost me too much. So see, working longer and harder for some might be appropriate. You know, if you're just sitting around not doing that much, this might be good, work longer and harder. But you can only work so hard. Here's the key, not to work harder, but smarter. When you've worked as hard as you can, doing the best you can in terms of physical output in the time, reasonable time, now here's the ultimate in the management of time, and that is you simply become more skillful. When I first got into sales, 
You know, I was around people that could get, you know, nine out of 10, eight out of 10. And when I first started, I could only get one out of 10. But here's what I did. I worked around the clock, around the clock so that I would make up in numbers what I lacked in skill. That's good in sales. You got to jot that down. When you're new, you make up in numbers what you lack in skill. Now, when you become more skillful, the numbers can go down because now you're your persuasive ability and all of that is now so high that you don't need to put as many numbers out. But at first, if you want to compete or if you want to really get good, you've got to put in the numbers. But if you get more from yourself, develop more of yourself, now the time management becomes an easier task. Now here's the next thing. Either you run the project or it runs you. I've found out when you start something, at first you're in charge. All of a sudden, a year later, it's in charge. Some of the companies I started, I'm telling you, I'm in control. A couple of years later, I'm out of control. At first, I've got it on the run. Two years later, it's got me on the run. Haven't got enough time. I'm dizzy with trying to get it all done. So here's part of the key, and that's to get in charge. Say, I'm going to take charge of my health. One of my albums is entitled, Take Charge of Your Life. Take charge of your time, take charge of your resources, which we're gonna talk about next. Take charge of your health. You're the one that's responsible for it. It's not a requirement of society that you not have a heart attack and take care of your family. That's not a requirement of society, but you must make it a requirement of yourself. Society doesn't require that you build a financial wall around your family, nothing can get through. That's not a requirement of society. It's a requirement you impose on yourself to build a financial wall around your family nothing can get through. Okay. So impose on yourself the self-development of being in charge, taking charge of your life and your health and your future and your responsibilities and all the rest. Next. Reasonable time is enough time to achieve all of your goals. Just jot that down. Reasonable time is enough time. I had to learn that. Reasonable time is enough time. Here's why. It's not the hours you put in, it's what you put in the hours. If you start depositing greater ideas into the hours you've got later than now, I'm telling you later, you can't believe the productivity that will flow. The ideas you can't think of now, a year from now, they'll start to flow. And when you deposit those ideas in the hours you've got, productivity multiplies by two, three, five, ten. Next, time management essential. We've already covered the first one, a written set of goals. And then do priorities on your goals. What's important this week? What's important this month? Here's the next one. Often review. Just go over your goals to make sure that your list is working for you. It's got you inspired. It's got you turned on. Somebody says, how come you're up so early? Say, if you were headed where I'm headed, you'd be up early too. Wow. If you were going to meet who I'm going to meet, you'd be up early. If it was going to stack up for you like it's stacking up for me, you'd be getting up early. Wow. Here's some more time management essentials. Learn to study what we call majors and minors. You pick up the phone. Here's what you must say when you pick up the phone. Is this a major conversation or a minor conversation? If it's minor, a few pleasantries and you're done. If it's major, maybe you've got to make a few notes. So here's the next one. Important conversations, make an agenda before you make the call. Just jot down a little agenda. It's so easy now to just talk out of your head. Did you ever hear a conversation end like this? Like this. Let's see, there was something else. See, you don't look that swift. I can't think of it right now. I'll call you back. See, you look a little incompetent. Let's see, there was something. It escapes me right now. Really? 
So if you got this now, make an agenda before you make a call if it's an important call. Now later that saves you all kinds of stuff. You call John in, the salesman, say, John, remember those four things we went over? He said, no, we didn't talk about that. And then you pull out your daytime or whatever, and there's the list you made when you made the call. He said, oh, yes, seems like I do remember. And you've got him with your list. If it's just salespeople especially can talk you out of what's in your head. It's true. No, we didn't talk about that. And if you don't have a little proof, I'm telling you, it's gone. So make an agenda before you make a call. So what's major, what's minor? Now here's the key on this. Don't major in minor things. If you take up major time to do minor things, I'm telling you, you'll be behind the curve constantly. Here's what we learn in sales training. What's major time and what's minor time? Here's minor time, thinking about prospects. Here's minor time, making lists of prospects. Here's minor time, keeping books on prospects. Here's minor time, going to see the prospect. Here's minor time, evaluating the prospect after you've been there. That's all minor time. Here's major time, in the presence of the prospect. That's, min that's major time. And if you took a look, if you're in sales and you took a look at a week, you'd say, my gosh, I'm spending 90% of my time on the minor stuff and so little time on the major stuff in the presence of. How many hours in the presence of in my day? How many hours in the presence of during my sales week? Because the time that really counts is in the presence of the prospect. Majors and minors. Here's another key time management essential. Don't mistake movement for achievement. It's easy to get faked out by being busy. Guy comes home at night all exhausted, falls in the chair and says, oh, I've been going, going, going. Here's the big question, doing what? It's not the going, going, going. Some people are going, 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 and they're doing figure eights. I mean, their progress is small. So don't mistake movement for achievement. Here's another one in sales we learned. Don't mistake courtesy for consent. If somebody's pleasant and they nod, you say, oh, they're going to buy. No, they're courteous. You can't mistake courtesy for consent. Now here's a big one, concentration. I had to learn this. All those years ago, I'm in the shower trying to compose a letter. Found it turns out to be a strange letter. So here's what I learned to do. Save the work till you get to the office. Save the work till you get to the work. Don't try to get to the office on the way to work. On the way to work, enjoy the way. In the shower, enjoy the shower. Then go to work when you get to work. I found this to be helpful. Concentration. Here's another big one. Learn to say no. I'm telling you, in such a social society we have now, it's so easy to try to be a nice person saying yes, yes, yes to everything. Find yourself overloaded. Now you've got to call and make the, well, gosh, you know, all the time it takes to back out of something that you said, said yes to too quickly. Here's what might be better. I don't think so, but if that changes, I'll call you. Little things you can use not to commit over commit yourself. My friend Ron Reynolds says, don't let your mouth overload your back. It's a good one. Now here's a big one on time management. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. I used to take my family to the beach and I would bring my briefcase. I learned not to do that. Or at the beach I'm saying I should be at the office, I should be at the office. Now my family's upset. Because I'm at the beach and I'm thinking office, office, office. Now when I'm at the office, I'm thinking what? I've got to get my family to the beach, the beach, the beach. So things are not going too well at the office because I'm thinking beach and things are not going too well at the beach because I'm thinking office. Here's what I learned to do. At the beach, be at the beach. At the office, be at the office. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. Now here's one of the most important ones. Don't play at work. Work is too serious. 
You don't want the reputation of being the office joker. It's not a good one. Yes, there's time for some pleasant stories. Yes, there's time for a little humor. Yes, uh, best if it's a happy office, of course. But I'm telling you, you've got to be serious about work because you're parting with a piece of your life for the work you do. Your work costs you a piece of your life. Here's what it's called, serious business. Not grim, not unhappy, but serious. Key. Don't play at work. The old expression, I don't think we use it anymore, horse around at the office. Play around, play jokes, play tricks. No place, not at the workplace. At the beach, yes. At the bar, yes. Somewhere else, not work. You got to treat work with all due conservative passion. Because it's leading you to your future. Here's another key phrase, all work is good. You may not like your job, but if it's the stepping stones to get you to where you want to, to go, you've got to appreciate your job. You don't have to have a passion for your job. Here's the ultimate passion, a passion for incredible success in every department of my life. That's the passion. But don't look down on some menial job you have to do to finally get you to where you want to go. No job is menial, menial. No job is not, no, every job is noble. Training life for pay, making a contribution to society. Next, analyze how you are. And if you have some weaknesses, if you can't, doesn't seem like you can change, here's the key, get it covered. I used to keep promising myself I'd keep the books, keep the books, keep the books. Finally, I gave that up. And back then, it only took me an extra 50, 60 bucks a month for some accountant to keep the books. I said, no, I'm going to save the 50 bucks. You can't believe what I started losing in productivity because I tried to save the 50 bucks. So the key is a lot of the time you can stay like you are, but just make sure you get it covered. Okay. Next, beware of the telephone and all other systems of communication, especially the telephone at home and systems of communication at home. And here's one of the best lines I've got for you for the weekend. Let all communication systems serve you, but don't let them intrude. When it comes time to have dinner with your family, you shut off all systems. Unless the ones that can take messages silently. Don't let the phone ring. Don't let anybody intrude. Come through the front door, nor the back door, nor through the telephone or any other device. So you can't reach John and his family when he's having dinner. The President of the United States couldn't get through. If you develop that kind of a reputation, father, mother, when we have dinner, when we're visiting and have this time with our family, nothing intrudes. So don't let these clever little devices keep intruding. You've got to have a place that's sacrosanct, it's, it's valuable. You don't let anything in for that period of time. Okay. Isn't that good advice? Yeah. Excellent advice. Here's the next one. Read all the books. You know, I've only got a few notes here on time management, but if you've got some particular challenges, you run a big organization, a big corporation, you've got some challenges, there's plenty of books. Now, here's what's next. Just be more alert to the things that might be stealing your time. Here's why, time is like capital. You can't let someone steal your seed corn, you can't let someone steal your capital, and you can't let someone steal your time. You must designate your time, and some of the time that you designate, you must not let anyone steal. Casual time, you might let someone intrude and steal a little bit and take a little bit, but not serious time. Next, one of the great time management savers is to learn to ask questions up front. Sometimes you talk to somebody for an hour, and then you ask questions and find out if you would have asked those questions up front, you could have saved yourself an hour. Asking questions up front helps you to get to the problem now. 
But if you just launch into some discourse, you might waste 30 minutes, waste an hour, when here's what you should have been talking about. After you finished an hour, you say, John, what's really the problem? He said, well, it's something personal. See, that's what you should have been talking about this whole hour. Key. Next, learn to think on paper. Now we're going to take a break. Some ways to think on paper. One, we've covered one. Solving problems. Take it out of your head and put it on paper. Another one is setting goals. Making these lists we've already started. Here's another good way to think on paper. It's a projects book. Each person you're working with and each project you're working on, get a loose leaf binder and a tab and some pieces of paper behind the tab and do a little continual summary of how it's going between you and that person and between you and that project. I call it a projects book. It is so useful to me. But what's going on between you and this person? When you last got together, what did you talk about? And you got a few notes there. Here's what we talked about the last time we got together. Now when you get together again, you can review that so you'll know better what to talk about. When the president gets ready to travel and he's going to meet some important people, guess what they bring him? All these briefing books. Right? The last time you were with Khrushchev, Kennedy is informed. Here's what he said and here's what you said. Kennedy said, oh, that's valuable. I need to remember that. If a person is important, it's worth a little running account. You might even have a project book for your children. Here's what's happening between me and my child. We've talked about this and we've talked about this and we've talked about this. Next, a day timer. Keeping track of all of your appointments. You know, mine is all filled with, you know, when to catch an airplane and when to do a seminar and when to sit down and have a conference, all the rest. Next is a game plan. You know, if you've got a house and the, you know, insurance is going to come due and some other things are going to come due, you just put it on a spreadsheet and make sure it's taken care of. Key phrase, take things out of your head and put them on paper. And the key is to just experiment with different ways that helps you to do that. Now here's the last one, thinking on paper. And that's to keep a journal. One of the things I'm known for around the world, have been now for 39, 40 years, is keeping a journal. Now my journal is not a, you know, it's not necessarily a, it's not like a diary. It might be part diary. You know, I'm flying over Ireland and I, I write down a few little things that impress me. Uh, today I met this person. Wow, what an extraordinary event. Today, this, I conducted this seminar in Rome. A thousand people stood up and sang for me. I've got a little bit of a diary in there. But here's what primarily your journal is for. Collecting good ideas. A journal is to collect good ideas on your health, good ideas for your business, good ideas for your future, good ideas for time management. Because I used to take notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes and restaurant placemats. And I threw all this stuff in a drawer. It did not serve me well. I finally learned to get a bound copy, right? And just keep a journal, right? If I was here, I had my journal, I'd be taking notes, right? These two days in my journal. Now, if you're caught without your journal, you just take the notes. When you get back home, you put those notes in your journal, throw the paper away. Because we don't usually go through paper to review. But see, my journals now make up a significant part of my own library. My journals all reserved privately for my children and my grandchildren. Can you imagine what I've collected over the years? It's unbelievable. There are three treasures to leave behind. I think you've already got those notes, right? Here they are. Number one, your pictures. Don't leave the event unrecorded. It takes only a fraction of a, cent, uh, of a second to say, here's who I was with. When I travel the world, Right? We take all these pictures, and here's one of the gifts. People send me the pictures they took of me and them. It's part of the treasures I have on the farm. Incredible. A picture's worth a thousand words to describe the scene, the emotion, what happened. Say, wow, this was an extraordinary day for me when I met these people. Here's what they told me happened to them when they went to my seminar 10 years ago. 
wow, the, the drama comes back if you've taken the pictures. It's one of the treasures to leave behind when you go. Remember the old photographs that we have now of, you know, 100 years ago, 70, 80 years ago, just a few photographs? What would it be like if you had thousands of photographs of the past, of your history, your mother, your father, right? grandparents? So change all of that now for your children. Leave all your photographs as a record. Here's what's next to leave behind, and that's your library. The books that changed your life, the books that changed your health, the books that rescued you from oblivion, the books that you passed on to other people, they were so exciting for you, the books that made you financially independent, the books that developed your leadership, the books that gave you wisdom to ponder when things were tough, the books that got you through the winter, the books that helped you to plant in the spring and harvest in the fall. What a treasure to leave behind. If you do that, here's what's for sure. Your books will be more valuable than your furniture. Wow. Now the third treasure to leave behind is your journals. The notes you took that helped you to live life as you lived it. Long after you're gone, a treasure that children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren will find so fascinating. They may use it to help guide their 